preparing for this lesson in Hebrew, um, I thought so much of letters I would get from my grandma, and they were just such wonderful, wonderful letters. And she always signed them Love Graham. So we turned it into a Love Graham, like a telegram. And when I would get one in the post office, I would yell, I have a Love Graham. And everyone would go to the dining hall, and we'd all um, come around to hear what she had to say. And it would always start with something pretty, um, pretty wonderful, and you know, this, um, oh, I hope you're doing well, and here, you know, is some advice. And so she would start out with some advice, but then we would get into the part we love because Eleanor just had a perm, and I'll tell you, it turned out awful. <laughs> <laughs> she would list all these little sides at the end of the letter. Oh, and by the way, don't forget to do this. Or, and would, they were just wonderful, and it was just uh, personal and so much of her personality. And when we finished up Hebrews, I thought, Chapter 12, at the end, he's still beseeching. He's heard this about them. He's still telling them. He's talking about the heaven of the Old Testament compared to the heaven of the New Testament. And then at the end, oh, by the way, can't you see him? Don't forget to obey your leaders. Be sure to entertain strangers. You know, he has this kind of checklist of things he wanted to get into. just didn't have time. But, you know, as long as I'm writing, I might as well throw these things into it. I love how real he becomes to us all the way to the end. So here we go as we close out Hebrews. We still have the author speaking to us, to the Hebrews audience, as Jews of the Old Testament. That hasn't changed, has it? Right from the beginning to the end, he is still speaking very much to Hebrews in a familiar and detailed description. He begins to describe a relationship. A relationship which is awesome. And not the awesome that we so casually use, like, oh, I just got an awesome color for my guest bedroom but awesome, filled with awe. A relationship where we stop to take off our shoes, where we fall on our face, where we tremble before our God. That is the awe he is talking about. We do it because we're filled with awe. Our Hebrews author has taken us on a ride. I loved, again, I mentioned earlier, Pastor Breckenridge said, it's a little bit like studying with someone who's bipolar. He's happy, he's sad, he's raging, he's controlling, he's beseeching, he's praying. It's been an interesting ride and it's been fun to go on it. Here he's no different. We just read about a relationship of God from the Old Testament. It rem he reminds us of a God behind the veil. A God who's only visible when mountains shook, when mighty winds blew, and when a cloud became a fires erupted. A God who stood apart. He begins down the tricky path because he wants us to know that God is still God. He is still awesome. But there's a new Zion and a new meeting place. No longer must we, must we quake in fear, but we can revel in that awesomeness. Revel in the God who wants to meet us. Imagine how new this is. Some of these Hebrews never hearing this. They still only know of the God who set apart, the God they fear. And he's saying, there is a new Zion, a new God. Let me read from Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gatherings and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better world than the world of Abel. Why did he take us down the path of Abel's sin last week? Why does he constantly mention that old God, sometimes annoyingly, referring to the Old Testament and quoting the Old Testament because it's what this audience knows and reminding them of where they've been, he can open a visual door. If someone starts talking about something scientific and something we've never heard of before, we tend to tune out. But when they bring us in with a story and a visual and something that's part of our past and part of our being, we tune right back in. Verse 28 says, it's getting smaller. Therefore, 
Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship and reverence with awe. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is something new. This is something they're not familiar with. God to them was a kingdom shaken. If you were in God's presence, the earth moved. There was fire, there was trembling, and people would die. Haggai, the book of Haggai says, all of creation will be shaken by God's voice. Oddly, as only this Hebrew's author can do, these are being offered as words of encouragement. A kingdom shaken by God's voice? How can that possibly be encouraging? How can they hear any encouragement? And it's because when the dust settles and the shaking has stopped, we're part of that permanent glory. We're part of the new Jerusalem, the new Zion. We're part of what remains. We are receiving heaven. A God judging us, shaking creation to its core, it sounds frightening. My grandpa was a man who evidently was intimidating to others. He was just grandpa to me and to my cousins. And people would say, your grandpa's kind of scary. And I'd think, really? Because, you know, he's just grandpa. I thought it was kind of funny. But evidently, to them, he was scary. And I think that's the point he's trying to make here. To the outsiders, God's voice judging him and shaking heaven, absolutely frightening. But I'm offering you a word of consolation. It's God who's judging us. To a believer, those words are words of comfort. It's no longer the law or the high priest or those awful Pharisees sitting in judgment. It's not even the Roman government who's sitting in judgment. It's God and we're his children. Words of comfort. We long for that judgment. We long for the earth to shake because it's not part, because it is part of the good news. We've already been chosen and God is fair and he keeps his promise. Hebrews 28 says we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Our receiving, not have received, or they received, or will receive, but we are receiving. It's present tense in the Greek. The Greek has this wonderful ongoing tense that means that it happened, and that it is happening, and that it will happen. The future is balanced with the present. The event that determines eternal life has already happened, and we're part of it. We are already participating in all of the benefits. Access is already available. He ends by saying, we offer God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. That worship doesn't give us access to this unshakable kingdom. It's access lived out. We don't worship so we can get in. We worship because we're already in. He ends with these wonderful verses, these wonderful verses of encouragement. And we're so excited to hear them because we're in. We're not standing on the outside looking in. They're comforting because we're there. And then you have to look at 13 and love all these little tidbits that he gives. He closes the book with a list of tips on how to live. The author has gone to great lengths to tell us we're in. We don't have to try out, accomplish anything, or go to get to heaven. We're already living in communion. So the tips he gives are just little added benefits, a better way to live. Continue to live, continue to love. I love that the word love in there is um, that mutual brotherly love, the Philadelphia. And then we move to 13.2, which if you know me and if you've been to my house, you've seen this in several places. I have it up on my walls. Remember to entertain angels, for in doing so, some have entered that's not how it goes at all. Remember to entertain strangers for doing so. Some have entertained angels unaware. I love it because it describes that amazing hospitality. The hospitality that reminds us of the Old Testament. Of Abraham welcoming people in. Of Lot opening his doors to welcome people in. who turned out to be angels. It opens the doors for us to go outside of our comfort zone. Not love thy neighbor but entertain a stranger. What does that even mean? 
Entertaining is not a cocktail party. When you think of entertaining, don't you think of people in fancy dresses and maybe there's some wine and there's music and, wow, they're good at entertaining. But it means giving of yourself. Be kind to your enemies. Entertain the stranger. And the other part of it I like is that little tease, that little maybe uh, kickback. Because if you do, you never know. You might be entertaining angels. It's very reminiscent to me of be kind to your enemies. Well, of course, but wait for it. Because in doing so, you might be heaping coals of flames on their head. I like when it has that little added benefit. <laughs> kind of nice. Who doesn't love that? Entertain strangers. Who are strangers? When did I see you hungry, or thirsty, or naked, or jailed, or old, and forgotten, or afraid, and lonely, or a small child? When did I see you doing any of that, Lord? And he says, you saw me when you saw all of the people in that situation. We do it because in doing so, we entertain Jesus every time. That's why we entertain strangers. That's why we give up ourselves. We are entertaining Jesus every time. And who knows, maybe just one of those times, it might also be an angel. I'm going to close with the poem that I opened with again. As we think about that heaven that the Old Testament stood apart, the heaven that every time Jesus, or the Creator, spoke would shake, and that shaking would cause us death and fear. And now it's a new heaven where when we see the shaking, all we can think about is that we're part of what remains. Holy, 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 God of power and light, wasn't it just yesterday we trembled in your sight? The mountain shook, the fire blazed, was then we knew we were near. And in your majestic awesomeness, we cowered in our fear. Holy, 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 dear God of might and power, could it be you wait for us at this very hour? The curtain torn wide open, creation tossed alone, and when the dust has settled, heaven is our own. For that which can't be shaken forever shall remain. For this we sing thy praises, Lord, and worship thy dear.